Hey you guys, it's Peter and welcome to my channel, Peter Likes Books. Did you like the video yesterday? Did you like the first few uh, readings, the first few chapters of my book? So if you didn't watch yesterday's video, you're gonna have to go back and watch it because I am reading my book, the Before Now, and after then, um, every day until we finish it. I'm reading like two or three chapters every single day. And um, I had a really good time doing that yesterday. So um, we're gonna go in here today. I, yesterday I did the preface and the first chapter. Um, and today I will um, be reading, I don't know, I don't know how long, let's see how long. Chapter two is, chapter three. I think I'm gonna read chapter two and chapter three today, um, and then we'll just keep on going forward each day. I will put in the description box um, what like what I'm reading in there, so if you get behind or you're looking for a specific video, you can go back in there and you can see which one. Okay. So you're gonna to know what's going on, you're gonna have to watch yesterday's video. <laughs> get it? Okay. Chapter two. Creston High School wasn't much different from my past high school, and it was obvious to me as soon as I walked into the title pole of other students that I didn't fit into their school of fish either. I could, tell, I could tell you how every school was the same and how there was a social hierarchy built into each school, but everyone already knows that, and I guess, in the long run, it doesn't really matter. You can only depend on yourself anyway. The concern for being popular isn't as great as it used to be, and having been raised by two aging punk rockers as parents, Sam and I were always encouraged to find our own identity. That was a little hard to do when your brother was good at everything and was, in fact, the most popular kid in school. I had lived in the shadow of the spotlight for so long that it had felt safe there, and even though I didn't have any of my own friends, I always had Sam. That had been enough. In the past month, Mom had encouraged me to meet new people and try to make friends, which was the most ridiculous statement in the world, like I was 10 and was going to ask someone over to my house to play. Back in those days, it was easy. Now you had to actually talk to someone, get their number, text them, and call them, friend them on Facebook, and follow them on Twitter. I missed being 10 for all kinds of reasons. I knew if Sam were alive, he'd tell me to try and talk to people and be myself. But I didn't know who I was, and Sam wasn't alive. If he had been, I wouldn't have this problem because I wouldn't have changed schools and I would still be following him around to parties and sitting on our bedroom floor while all of his friends made fun of each other. Sam was gone and he wasn't coming back. After blindly wandering the maze of new hallways, I found the door to my first class, French 2, walked inside the empty classroom and chose a seat in the back corner. I pulled out my notebook, a pen, and a copy of The Sun Also Rises, which I had just started reading the night before. After a few minutes, a short woman with severe black bob with a severe black bob and glasses walked in and set a worn uh, briefcase on her desk. She looked up and smiled at me. Are you sure you wouldn't like to sit closer to the front of the class? I shook my head, smiling best I could. As she took out her class roster, she began looking through the names while slowly walking back towards me. Let me guess. You're Wally Smith. I shook my head again. <clears throat> Pat Jones? No, no, I know him, she squinted. Hmm. How about Danny Goldstein? I looked up in surprise. You're probably wondering how I know, she said, retracting her, retracing her steps towards her desk as a few other students walked in. With those perfect golden locks, she couldn't be anyone else but Danny Goldstein. She let her tongue roll on the last name. When we were younger, Sam and I had actually been referred to as the Goldilock Goldsteins because of our matching curly blonde hair. As we grew up, our hair never changed, but somehow, thankfully, we lost the nickname. It's a mystery I'll never tell, but that is, in fact, one of my favorite books, she commented with a wink, before attempting to bring order to the class. Everyone sat down and she told us that her name was Mrs. Sconce, but we were to refer to her as Madame Sconce. We weren't allowed to speak any English in class, just French. One at a time, she wanted us to go up to the front of the class and say one word that described us. She pointed to me. A Monsieur uh, Goldstein? I put my book down and slowly trudged to the front of the class. Uh, my name is Danny Goldstein and dot dot dot. I don't know why I said dot, dot, dot. Uh, en Francais, Monsieur Goldstein, she interrupted. I went silent, trying to think of how to say what I wanted in French. As I looked out over the faces staring back at me, a muscular kid in my row said with a lisp, My name's Danny, and I'm a faggot. Exaggerating the words to sound like an OMG teen girl. The whole class burst out laughing. Mrs. Sconce stood up from her desk, but when I looked over at her, she just stared back at me, appearing to be in as much disbelief as I was. Thanks, Danny, she cautiously interjected. That was good enough. You can sit down. I walked back toward my seat, and as I passed the kid who had yelled at me, he whispered, faggot, under his breath again, initiating a, an eruption of laughter from the class. I was used to these words. Fag, faggot, queer, fairy, ass assassin, butt pirate, fruit, fudge packer, and gay boy. 
Physically, our voices have been the only main difference between me and Sam. I'm not quite sure why he was blessed with having a deep macho voice while mine was cursed with a lisp, but mine was a dead giveaway. I often wondered if I wasn't gay if people would still make fun of me for my voice, and if they did, would it still hurt as bad? Uh, Sam had always defended me to people and told me not to pay them any attention, but it still hurt. Being made fun of for something you couldn't change was the worst feeling in the world, and as a result, I had developed a strong resentment against my voice, which is why most of the time, I just stayed silent. Mr. Jones, Mrs. Sconce called out while beckoning with her hand, since you apparently have so much to say, why don't you come up here and share with us? En français, Madame Sconce, he said, sending a ripple of laughter across the uh, room again. He stood up and I realized that although he wasn't very tall, he appeared to be much stronger than I had thought while he was sitting down. As he walked to the front of the room, Mrs. Sconce moved to the side, almost like she was afraid of him. My name is Pat Jones. I am the quarterback for the Creston High School Greyhounds, and I plan on leading us to another state victory. The room cheered. He turned and smirked as Mrs. Sconce, at Mrs. Sconce and then looked over the classroom back to my corner. And I am not a faggot, he called out, walking towards his seat as the room fell silent. While he walked back to his desk, his eyes were locked into, my, into mine. As I looked away, I noticed a girl, three seats up, put her leg out, tripping Pat and sending him straight onto his face. Immediately, everyone in the room started laughing. Pat quickly stood back up and sat in his seat. The girl was tall and lanky with short burgundy hair. She quickly stood up and shoved her finger into Pat's chest as she said, Neither am I, but you're a fucking asshole. I don't usually cuss in my videos, so I'm like having a hard time like reading my language, which I... Anyway. Neither am I, but you're a fucking asshole. She grabbed her bag from the floor and began walking to the door, turning back to Mrs. Sconce as her hand reached the doorknob. And if you can't control your own classroom, then there's no reason for me to be here. She walked out, slamming the door behind her. Mrs. Sconce tried to pull the class together, but she had lost her position of dominance and the entire class knew she was no longer in control. Pat stood up and continued to shout, I am not a faggot, I am not a faggot, while I just sunk lower and lower in my seat behind my book. If there was ever a perfect time for the power of invisibility, it would have been now. It would have been then. After about 10 minutes of complete chaos, the door opened again, and another woman walked in, clapping her hands together. People, people, she shouted, silencing the room as she looked around. We will not act this way, or every last one of you can go and sit in Dean Gomez's office. Do you understand me? Now I want you to give Mrs. Sconch your attention and respect her as a teacher. She turned and said something to Mrs. Sconch, who pointed in my direction. The other teacher looked back at me and smiled sympathetically. Turning back to Mrs. Sconce, she whispered something before hurriedly walking out of the classroom, leaving the door open behind her. I looked down at my watch and realized we only had about five minutes left in class. 300 seconds. Mrs. Sconce handed out a worksheet and told us she wanted us to have it finished by the next day. When the bell rang, Pat stood up and looked back at me. See you soon, sweetie, he smirked and blew me a kiss. He walked out without a second glance, holding hands with some blonde girl in a short white sh skirt. They were, no doubt, the power couple the power couple of Creston High School. I quietly correct, collected my belongings, careful to avoid contact with anyone in the room. As I reached the front of the room, Mrs. Scott stopped me. I'm sorry, I should have said something or sent him out of class, but I... She paused, shaking her head. I just didn't know what to say. I smiled and nodded, letting her know I understood. I was all too used to teachers who never stood up for me or punished the kids who made fun of me. When I was younger, I had believed it was because they agreed with the hate directed towards me. But as I got older, I realized they were just as afraid as me. It was easier to be quiet and not bring any attention to yourself. It takes someone very brave to tilt windmills. Thinking of everyone who had silently witnessed my past made me wonder about the tall girl with the purple hair. Was she in fact my modern day Don Quixote? Just as I was walking to the door, my thoughts filled with her words, she popped her head into the metal frame like a giant grape lollipop. Danny, hey, she called, her hands on her hips, towering over me. She had on a baggy black t-shirt and short black uh, skirt with black tights. Huge black combat boots protected her calves. Before I could get out of the door, she reached around me, embracing me tightly with her long arms. I noticed she smelled like clove cigarettes and coffee. She held on for so long, I thought she might never let go. Finally, her arms fell limp. I'm Cher, she said, as in gypsies, tramps, and thieves, and yes, the mother of the one and only Chaz Bono. My mom is like the biggest Cher fan in the whole world, so of course, I got the incredible honor of being named after the pop diva, Sherilyn Sarkissian herself. She grabbed my hand and began walking down the hall. I've never heard of Cher or Sherilyn, whoever, I said, sheepishly. She stopped in the middle of the hallway. What? I mean, you are gay, right? I had never really been asked that so bluntly before. There was something refreshing about the way she had asked me. I nodded. 
Cher made an exaggerated swoon. Thank God, I mean, my mom's been praying all her life that I would have a gay best friend, and now I found one, and I just know we're going to have so much in common. I can't wait for you to meet her, and Henry, and Maud. Of course, you'll meet them too. You're going to love them all. You're going to love all of them. She kept babbling, but I stopped listening because something very important had just happened to me. I had just made my very first friend. Chapter three. Cher walked, uh, me past, Cher walked me past the cafeteria telling me that she would rather be dead than caught mingling with the minions of mediocrity. Even though I had no idea what this meant, I liked the sound of it. She stopped at the row of vending machines and bought two packages of powdered donuts before grabbing my hand again and leading me into the brick co courtyard surrounding the cafeteria. Outside, Summer was unaware that school had started. The temperature of late August in Indiana hadn't begun to cool and I started sweating instantly. Other students were scattered around the, meta the metal picnic tables, but Cher led us over to a giant tree dividing the courtyard. She threw her backpack down on the ground and sat down against the trunk of the tree, motioning for me to sit across from her. As I positioned myself in the grass, she began digging through her bag and brought out a large red and black plaid thermos. I watched as she kept fishing until she found a well-used plastic mug adorned with a skull and crossbones. Without missing a beat, she poured herself a cup of coffee and another in the lid of the thermos, handing it to me. I lifted the makeshift mug to my lips and took a sip, overcome by the surprising strength of the of this still warm coffee. Offering, offering up a donut, she suggested, let's play instant history. Instant history, I asked? Yeah, your background story. You know, like where you're from and your family, that kind of, the kinds of music you like and all that jazz. I laughed. I had never met anyone quite like Cher and especially didn't know anyone my age who used the word jazz as a metaphor. I guess my story is just like everyone else's. I looked around the courtroom. I looked around the courtyard. Couples flirted with each other across turkey sandwiches and slices of cheese pizza. A group of guys uh, played games on their phones while a girl with, a large, with large headphones sobbed as she frantically wrote in a notebook. Several guys kicked a hacky sack and several girls sat in a row against the brick wall. Their skirts pulled up as they tanned their legs. I was, really wasn't like any of these people. My story was much different. Then I'll tell you mine, Cher began. I never knew my dad. My mom met him at a bar in Chicago where she was a bartender and he was a graduate student at Northwestern University. He fell in love with her long black hair and told her she looked like Cher. Well, that was enough for her. They dated for a month until she told him she was pregnant and then she never saw him again. She had thought about trying to get in touch with him when I was born, but she didn't want him feeling obligated. So it's just been the two of us ever since. We moved down here after I was born to be closer to my grandma so she could help with me while my mom went back to school. Now she's a nurse at a drug treatment hospital for teenagers and she sees half of all these crazies come in and out of her hospital on a regular basis. She waved her hand over the other kids in the courtyard. After taking a sip of her coffee, she started looking for something on her phone. Here, she said, showing me a, her phone. This is Cher. I looked at the screen and saw a picture of a thin woman with, a long, with long black hair parted down the middle. Next to her was a short man with a funny mustache. That's Sonny, Chaz's dad. He's dead now. She showed me another picture of Cher with a huge black feather headdress. That's Cher at the Oscar. She was nominated for Silkwood and Moonstruck, but only one for Moonstruck. She looked at the picture for a few seconds before clicking off her phone. My uncle won an Oscar, I blurted out, before realizing how crazy my admission might sound. Cher's jaw dropped. dropped. I was beginning to figure out that she had a tendency to be highly dramatic. Shut the fuck up. I started laughing. No, it's true. He's not really my uncle, though. Just my mom's best friend. She sat up on her knees excitedly. Is he a movie star? What movie was he in? Holy shit, my mom's going to die. She sat back down and crossed her legs while running her hand through her wild hair. Okay, so every year for the Oscars, my mom and I dress up and act like we're movie stars. We wear name tags with our names, and then we sit around, and I drink mocktails, you know, fake drinks, and eat cheese and chat at the TV when our favorites don't win. Every year, I try to be someone super famous, but every year, my mom wears this uh, same silver sweater set. True story. This is, uh, my mom reads, or wait, every year I try to be someone super famous, but every year my mom wears the same silver sweater, sweater set with a name tag that reads Sharon Stone, even though she doesn't look anything like Sharon Stone. This year I bought this amazing vintage taffeta dress from the thrift store, and Henry, oh yeah, he's my boyfriend. Well, he wore a vintage tux, and we went as Meryl Streep and Clark Gable. I know, it makes absolutely no sense, but it was hilarious nonetheless. The speed at which, the speed at which Cher spoke was unbelievable. I had never heard anyone speak that fast in my entire life. She took another sip of her coffee and looked at me with a strange look of confusion on her face that reminded me of Dory from Finding Nemo. What were we just talking about? She finally sat still, sipping around her coffee. I could hardly believe only moments before she had been railing ahead at full speed. Suddenly, a look of complete recognition came over her face. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. You are going to tell me about your famous movie star uncle. Who is it? Who is it? No, let me guess. 
Is it Bradley Cooper? Is it Ben Affleck? She rustled around in her backpack, bringing out a pack of clove cigarettes and a black lighter. Alex Knight, I said. Cher stopped moving completely and her eyes rolled up, fixing directly into mine. Shut the fuck up. Your uncle is no fucking way, Alex Knight. I nodded. She lit a cigarette, throwing the pack and lighter back into her purse. I have literally read Suburban Wasteland like five times. That book changed my life. She paused for a second. Could I meet him? Sure, I said. He's actually flying in this weekend to stay with us for a while. Cher fake fainted against the tree, the back of her hand against her forehead, and her long legs twisted in front of her. It can't be true. I, Sherilyn, Cher, Sarkissian, Wagnowski, am going to actually meet the one and only Alex Knight. She sat up suddenly, eyes wide with uh, excitement. As soon as you walked into class today, I and that ridiculous pack keeping up with the Joneses Jones made fun of you. I knew we were destined to be friends. She reached over and kissed my cheek. So what's the rest of your story, she asked, just as the bell ending lunch rang and a teacher walked out into the courtyard. Cher quickly put out her cigarette and stood up, grabbing her backpack. I guess I'll have to find out later. She pulled a black Sharpie from her pocket and capping it with her teeth and snatched my hand, writing down a phone number. Text me later. I have early release after six period because I go to work, but we sh uh, should definitely talk tonight. We walked inside together. She continued to talk on and on about Uncle Alex. Once we reached the crossway halls leading to the cafeteria, she hugged me goodbye and ran off in the other direction. I watched her long legs awkwardly pump down the hallway and, I w and wished I could be so confident and unafraid. I realized I hadn't told her much about myself at all, but instead had hid behind the same, had, had hid behind the spotlight of Uncle Alex, the same way I had with Sam. Walking to my class, I pulled my phone out of my back pocket and programmed her number into my contacts. I noticed she was the only C name in my contact list, making me le feel less excited about the fact that I actually made a friend. Same page I left. The rest of the day went by pretty quickly, and before I knew it, my watch read 310. It was finally time to go home. The school's closing bell rang, and I swam my way through the torrent of other students until I arrived at my locker. I was trying to sort my books between ones I needed for homework and ones that could stay behind when a familiar ripple of laughter broke out behind me. Turning around, I found I was encircled by Pat Jones and a group of guys I had never seen before. How are you doing, babe? Pat asked, followed by laughter from his friends. I fought the urge to slam my locker and run. But I knew if I tried, my head would be used to leave a permanent mark in the metal door. Sometimes it was easier to stay and suffer for the short term than to have a permanent scar reminding you of the past. Not feeling so strong now that your freaky girlfriend is gone? Pat grabbed the back of my neck with his thick, muscular fingers. So I was thinking, you're a fag and uh, maybe I'm a fag too. Maybe you could come over to my house tonight and we'll have a date. He smiled as his friends started laughing again. I don't cook, but I'm sure we could figure something out. His name echoed down the hallway, called out by a faraway female. Yeah, Janice, I'm coming, he screamed before turning back around. Well, maybe not tonight, but how about a rain check? They walked away, slapping each other's backs as they stretched the width of the hallway. I had endured the same, endured the same kind of torment for years and had never told Sam for the simple fact that I didn't want him to step in and take care of it. That would have only made it worse. I learned over time to just take it and shut my mouth. Eventually, the pats of the world forgot about you and moved on to someone else. The worst part was that deep down inside, you knew that there was a truth to everything they said. And even if that truth wasn't bad or good, they still owned part of it. They owned a piece of you. Feeling safe, I turned around, closed my locker, slung my backpack over my shoulder, and walked towards the front door. Since my dad was perpetually, li perpetually late for everything, I knew I still had a good 10 minutes or so before he would show up. I walked to the brick wall in front of the school where my mom had... where. Mom had dropped me off and leaned up against it, the heat from the brick bleeding through my shirt. To my left, I saw a guy walk up and lean against the wall about 10 feet away. He had a dark tan and looked Latino. Thick black hair twisted in a hundred different directions flopped around on top of his head. Pouty lips mouthed the words to whatever song he was listening to from under the giant headphones. Underneath the cuffs of his khaki shorts, curly dark hair reflected in the sunlight of his muscular legs over calf length, black socks and black vans. Black Ray-Ban Wayfarers shaded his eyes, but somehow I could tell he was looking at me. He was beautiful. For the longest time, we stood there in silence, watching each other out of the corners of our eyes. Just as I thought I saw Dad's car turn into the park school parking lot, the guy turned to me, taking off his, sun his headphones. Cool hair, he smiled, taking off his sunglasses and exposing the brownest eyes I had ever seen. You, you too, I stammered shyly. He laughed, walk, walking past, walking, he laughed, walking closer to me. He reached into his pocket and took out a pack of blackjack gum, handing me a piece. I took the gum out of the wrapper and slowly started chewing it, letting the licorice taste fill my mouth. I carefully, I carefully folded, I carefully folded the wrapper and placed it in my pocket. What's your name, he asked. 
Danny. Nice to meet you, Danny. I'm Rusty, he said. Actually, my name is uh, Jose Luis, but everyone calls me Rusty. For what felt like the longest time, he just stood there looking at me. Dad's Porsche convertible finally made its way into the parking lot and came to a halt right in front of us. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow, Danny, he smirked, putting on his sunglasses, and tell your dad that's a sweet ride. With a smile, he walked over to an old light blue minivan pulling in behind my dad. Through the, window, through the windows, I could see a woman with tan skin and shoulder length uh, hair in the driver's seat and a bunch of little kids in the back. I watched as he climbed in the passenger seat, turned around and smiled at me again, and they drove off. Is that a new friend? Dad inquired as I slipped into a sports car. It still smelled like Jenny's perfume, instantly making me angry that he had probably been late because they had been together. I don't know. Well, maybe you could invite him over some weekend to swim or have a barbecue or something. I didn't know what to say. How could I explain to my dad that I had just met the first guy who had ever given me what everyone else had always called butterflies? Instead of trying, I just sat back and chewed on that delicious gum, smiling to myself for the first time in a very long time. So that's the end of that chapter. By the way, there really was a Rusty when I was in high school. I've talked a lot about it on my vlog and that was how this whole book started was all because of him. So anyway, um, yeah, put your comments in the comment section below and I'll be back tomorrow and we will read chapters four and five. I love you guys and I will see you then. Bye.